Welcome to episode number 298 of Category 5 Technology TV. I'm your host, Robbie Ferguson. I am Sasha Dermatis. It is Tuesday, June 4th, 2013. Welcome to the show. Hello. All right. So coming up in the newsroom, we have Microsoft is bringing the start button back to Windows 8, but it... Yeah, but it still sucks. What? Yeah. What? Yeah. Sorry. Still? (laughs) Still sucks. Um, Also sucks. Visually impaired people have are having trouble signing an online petition to demand better accessibility because the petition itself is not accessible. Um, which is <laughs> fabulous and ironic. Wow. Yeah. Um, here's a good question. Should the government be allowed to block internet pornography by default? Oh, we'll have to talk about that. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Also, if you can't remember your password, you would you remember to take a pill? That that is interesting. interesting. Yeah. yeah. And the makers of Minecraft have launched an open beta for a new battle game. No way. Yeah. That's that, cool. Yeah. I didn't know they were making other games. That is. I want to hear all about it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, stick around. These stories and more are coming up later in the show. What else is coming up? We're going to actually be looking at a DSLR camera. We're wondering, here's the what if. Could you use a digital SLR camera with HDMI output and Telestream Wirecast from cat5.tv slash Wirecast to stream a live broadcast? Could you? Gonna have to stick around and find out. Can it be done? We're gonna try it right here tonight on Category 5 Technology TV. Don't go anywhere, we'll be right back. This is Category 5 Technology TV. At EcoAlkalines, we believe you should be able to trust your batteries not just here, but here, here, and here. But with one exception, you should also be able to trust your batteries here. EcoAlkalines are the world's first and only certified carbon neutral battery manufactured to the highest standards of recycling and quality, without any trace amounts of harmful chemicals like mercury, lead, or cadmium. EcoAlkalines provide performance that rivals leading national alkaline battery brands at a comparable price. Find out more about the EcoAlkalines difference. EcoAlkalines.com This is Category 5 Technology TV, episode number 298, and it's uh, June 4th, That is correct. I would like to welcome some of our new registered users. Hey, everybody. Or viewers. Algo Cipher. Algo Cipher. Hi, yeah. Nice to have you here. Yeah. Studio KPP. Hey, Studio KPP. And Raul. So, Raul. Welcome, Raul. From the Phantom of the Opera. Dun, 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 dun. Dun. No, you mean. Dun, 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 dun. That's right. Dun, dun. That is Get what it I right. mean. Sorry. <laughs> Get it right. That's right. Tonight, if you have a mobile device, <laughs> if you've got your mobile device handy, hey, pull it out. I'm going to bring up a handy little QR code here for you. <laughs> And all you have to do is scan that code, go to m.cat5.tv. You can listen to Category 5 Technology TV Radio. TV Radio. That's, TV Radio. That's pretty interesting. Yes. How can TV be on the radio? Well, it's our mobile website, m.cat5.tv. Check it out, and you will be able to listen to Category 5 Live, or you can actually watch Category 5 Live through the mobile site on Perfect. your mobile device. Perfect if you're on a treadmill. Absolutely. That's I think right. we were mentioning just before the show <laughs> that, uh, that it's really a kind of a show that you want to jog to. So Yeah, it's, yeah. it's a rockin' show, so <laughs> there you go. Category 5.tv is a member of the Tech Podcast Network. If it's tech, it's here. And the International Association of Internet Broadcasters. Thanks, Sasha. Uh, one of the things I've been experimenting with lately is trying to increase the video quality here at, at Category 5 Technology TV. 
our sound, of course, as you can hear, is is quite good these days. Um, we got out of using wireless microphones, and now we use hardwired mics. Uh, these headsets, which are close proximity to our mouths, that goes into a mixing console and a Behringer uh, Ultramizer Pro um, compressor, and then straight into a BBE Sonic Maximizer. So we have a really good audio chain. Everything sounds pretty good that way. But as far as visually goes, now that's kind of the next logical step for the show in order to increase the quality of the broadcast. We're shooting currently with a Canon Vixia HFR10, and that camera is essentially just a consumer camera. It's, it's I wouldn't say bottom of the, the line, but um, now these ones are currently, you know, they're discontinued at this point. We've had it for several years, but this camera was economical uh, at the time, as well as it, it does have what we needed in that it has HDMI output. So with that HDMI live feed out, output, uh, we're able to plug that into a Blackmagic Intensity Pro, uh, that's a capture card that has HDMI input as opposed to output, and then into Telestream Wirecast, and that gives us live camera switching, and then we're able to actually use that camera, and it works very, very well. But it is a consumer camera. It's got a very uh, small lens. It's got no ability to add any um, different lenses or anything like that. There's no, uh, there's no lens ring that we can screw a new lens onto it. So it is, it's really just a consumer camera that you want to be able to pull out of your pocket and be able to shoot something for the, with your family and stuff. But in this scenario, it's worked really well for us, but the quality is not what you would hope for in a, in a broadcast because it has basically the aperture doesn't allow for a, a shallow depth of field. So what that means is that the background basically is is in sync with my focus. So everything is kind of in focus in the studio. You don't get that depth of field that we looked at last week with Eric on the show. And so I started looking at different options, what we could do. One of my friends is selling his uh, T2i. It's a Rebel EOS from Canon. And I wanted to take a look at it. So I, I just asked him if I could borrow it for, for the week and, and show you what, uh, what would happen if we plugged this into the same chain. So we're going to plug it into um, the same HDMI cable going into the Blackmagic Intensity Pro, going into Telestream Wirecast. Because I got into the forums and I'm looking for ways to get that shallow depth of field on the show. And it, it occurred to me that, okay, well, DSLRs these days, they do 1080p video. They have HDMI output. A lot of them do. But what are the restrictions? What are the limitations? And what can be done and what can't be done with a DSLR? reason that I wanted to look at my friend's T2i is because the, uh, the Canon series, they have a really good firmware hack. Not official, okay? So it's, it's kind of use at your own risk, but it is available to you, and with Magic Lantern is the name of the hack, it apparently or supposedly will remove all of the overlays that are on the screen. That's important because you don't want to have your focus uh, things and all that. We'll take a look at that in just a few minutes. I'm not going to actually install Magic Lantern because I'm just borrowing this from a friend, uh, but I will show you what, what I mean by that. So um, with my Nikon D5100, now I, pref I, I prefer to shoot with Nikon myself. Uh, but it doesn't really. The firmware hacks aren't really there um, when it comes to video streaming from the HDMI port. So then you've got all that stuff on the screen, and you know you see your battery indicator, and it's it just doesn't work. So so I wanted to look at the Canon line because of the fact that the firmware hacks will allow you, if you're happy with the quality and you're happy with the way that it works, it will allow you to remove all of those like HUD icons and things like that. So that's pretty cool. So I've got my HDMI mini cable, which is going into the Blackmagic Intensity Pro and straight into Telestream Wirecast, which we're using to broadcast tonight. And I'm just going to simply turn on the, uh, the T2i, and we'll see what happens here. There we go. So we've got uh, on-screen display, which is promising. Let's take a look at our menu system here. And you'll see I've already been playing, but a couple of things that I want to, uh, to do right off the bat, just kind of go through here and make sure that everything is set up the way that we want. First thing is I want to turn off auto power off. Sometimes your camera is set to automatically turn off after four minutes to conserve battery life. Because we're going to be shooting live video, you don't want that feature. Next step is we're going to go down to live view function settings. And this is kind of cool. This is in the default firmware. So this is what I'm doing for tonight. Of course, you're probably going to install Magic Lantern because you're, if, if you decide to go this route, um, you're going to want to get rid of the, the on-screen display. So live view shoot, we're going to enable that. Grid display, of course you don't want a grid on your screen because that's going to obstruct the view. Metering timer, uh, you can set that however you'd like. If your lights, you know, we've got studio lights here, so the setting doesn't really matter because it's 
it's going to meter and it's going to stay the same for the entire duration of the shoot. And then the auto fo- auto focus mode. Um, this is kind of a funny thing because it's really quite irrelevant with the T2i. The autofocus is not real time. It's not active servo, and it is not uh, in any way useful at all. Uh, so what you set there is is pointless. It doesn't matter. Um, I'm going to turn it to quick mode just because that's going to have the least amount of display on the screen for us today. So now if I switch to live mode, which is to push this little camera button on the T2i, we should suddenly <laughs> see a black screen. So what is it? Oh, there we go. All right. We actually do have video. So let's take a look at Telestream Wirecast. I, I know I'm sorely out of focus there. I can turn the focus ring and get that better. Uh, So looking at Telestream Wirecast, let's go show source settings. And we're going to go to our Intensity Pro just to see what we're actually pulling in. This is HD 1080p, at, uh, and it's interlaced at 59.94 frames per second. So I'm, of course, deinterlacing that video. And you can see that it is pulling in a full 1920 by 1080p, uh, or 1080, so it's uh, 1080p. But there's some interesting stuff going on in the screen. We've got all this HUD, uh, and it is kind of centered in the middle of the screen. So what we want to do is we actually want to push our display button here, and we'll be able to eliminate all that, see how we can toggle through the display settings. I, I remember I do not have Magic Lantern installed, so we're, we're still going to see that square in the middle of the screen for now, just for the sake of this demonstration. But of course, by installing Magic Lantern, the firmware, you're going to be able to do, uh, you're going to be able to eliminate that. So. It is working, it's streaming, and you'll see something interesting is that we've actually got some black bars on the left and right of your screen. Uh, So we're actually getting some letterboxing here because the camera is only able to output about 1600 by 1080 uh, pixels. So it's not true 1080p, it's actually cropped off in kind of, I don't think it's quite a 4 by 3, but it is, you know, it's it's a little bit more toward the square spectrum than, than the widescreen. So what we can do there, of course, is on Telestream Wirecast. So we're just going to bring up that shot. And because, remember, we're actually receiving this signal at 1600, I think it is 1600 by 1080p with when you count in the, the crop, uh, the letterboxing on the sides, it, it, we're not going to get any loss to the video quality as long as we stay within the the confines of 1600 by 1080. So because we're shooting and, and broadcasting at 720p, so 720p, uh, we've got 1280 by 720 to work with. So I could, in fact, bring this image in quite close if I wanted to, but really all I want to do in Telestream Wirecast is just bring it so that those letterboxing edges are cut off position that however you like. Okay, so now we've got a frame that is not letterboxed, looks a lot better, and now we can actually shoot live video, as you can see, in crystal clarity. You can even see the dust on my keyboard. That is fantastic. All right, so let's put this on the tripod and and actually take a look at how good this looks. And of course, comparing to the Vixia uh, HFR10, here we go. Putting the tripod mount on here, and I'm just going to take this over. Okay, so let's pop this on the tripod here, and I'm just shooting with an 18 by uh, 18 by 55 millimeter lens. This is the kit lens that comes with the camera. I'm just going to bring my chair into focus there, and notice I'm using the focus ring. We're not going to use the autofocus. As I said, it's absolutely useless on this camera uh, when it comes to shooting video. I'll show you what it actually does. So this is the autofocus mode. And if I wanted to focus, so let's say I want to focus on that chair, what happens is it actually goes black. It says busy. And then it shows me the points. And then it's in focus. But it does that every time. So if somebody moves and you need to autofocus, that's the autofocus. It's completely useless in video mode. So that's why I'm going to disable it. We're going to use our own manual focus by using the focus ring and we can do all that we can create a depth of field to some degree but also we do get it's pretty awfully good quality video So let's position this camera so that I can go sit down and we'll compare the two there we go you see that the uh, auto exposure kinda took over there for a moment 
now it's stabilized. I've got it set to a low number, so it's it's pretty quick to, to fix things. So here I am on the Vixia RF uh, HFR10, and here I am on the Canon uh, T2i. So the quality difference is quite stark. Um, on the T2i, you can see that the edges... Now, I've worn this shirt on purpose because you can really see the difference between the two, sh the two shots, uh, between those two cameras. So do keep in mind that, of course, this square that's in front of my face, that's just the autofocus that is included in the Canon uh, T2i. With the firmware patch that we could install, the Magic Lantern, we'd be able to remove that. Another test, uh, you know, my mug has a lot of writing on it, and we can see the difference in the clarity of that writing. I don't know if you can, you probably can't actually read that at home, maybe you can, but uh, certainly not on the, on the Vixia, but possibly on the T2i. There is a very stark difference in quality. So the question becomes, is this a viable solution for a broadcast such as ours? Because it looks great, right? Right, right. So, so we've got to kind of weigh, okay, well, video quality is great with mm -hmm. the DSLR and that and these days you can get a, a digital SLR camera and it looks really really good as you can see from from my comparison mm -hmm. uh, I shot Abigail's wedding with those two cam well actually I shot it with my D5100 the Nikon camera as well as the Vixia uh, HFR10 oh, okay I don't know why I always have to think about that let's <laughs> mix them up um, so if you if you go to her bio Abigail's bio on our website category5.tv you'll actually see the difference in quality between a consumer camera and a DSLR. Right. Interesting fact, too, as I was shooting the wedding, I actually shot everything manual focus when I was using the DSLR. No auto-focusing at all. Everything is manually focused. So uh, with a show like this, I think it could really, really work because we're stationary. We're not moving around. Mm -hmm. We rarely are doing anything that is going to change the focal point of, of the camera. So, right. yeah, maybe sometimes we'll have a product that will hold up, and so then all of a sudden that product is out of focus, but you could get used to the fact that, okay, your focus field, your, your f-stop field of, or depth of right. field is right about here. Work within so the limit. So you work within that space. Mm -hmm. I think it could work in a show like this. So the pros really, become it looks great. you got to admit that, uh, and, and it, it just looks fantastic with the DSLRs, and the further that you get back with the tripod the more kind of depth of field that you can create we're mm -hmm. only about three feet away from the back wall here so there's not a lot of depth there but you could even see that with the t2i we we can create a little bit of a depth of field and it does look a little bit sharper as far as the 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 focal point the mm -hmm. subject of the the video um so not only do we get the the depth of field um but you're able to change lenses so if you want to shoot something from, you know, you want to get really good close-ups and you want to use a 200 millimeter lens, that's all very economical mm -hmm. to do. It's not like buying a red where you've got to buy hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of lenses. Like you can get a, a good $500 lens that could revolutionize your shooting. Right. Make it really, really good. Um, the source is, is really close to 1080p, true 1080p. As you saw, we did get some letterboxing. We had to zoom it in. But because we're shooting in 720p, it actually doesn't matter to us. We're not losing any quality. And in fact, we've got more information there visually than 720p. So we could even zoom in a little bit further, mm -hmm. and it would still look perfect. So that's good. Those are. There are some really bad things about shooting with DSLR, too. <laughs> and this is, here's what you need to what know. What are the they? Cons. What the cons. are the cons? Okay, so the T2i, mm -hmm. you saw what I did there with the camera. I set it so that it would not turn off automatically. Right. But a DSLR is still a DSLR. They're not camcorders. And so they're not built to shoot for long extended amounts of time. So what happens is because the aperture is open and the, the mirror gets really, really hot in mm -hmm. order to prevent damage to the system... What happens? The camera turns off. Okay. With the T2i, there's no, no matter warning, what. No matter what. There's no way to stop it from turning off. There are some firmware hacks that will allow you to extend the amount of time, but it's very, very dangerous because it's a safety feature that will actually keep your camera from burning itself out. So with the T2i... That is, that's a huge con. That's a huge con. 
when we shoot a, a one hour show. Unless you want just to shoot a 29 minute show. Or a 20 minute show because <laughs> you wouldn't want to accidentally approach that. Like limit. You- I'm talking the T2I turns off. No warning, no indicators, no beep to warn you that it's about to happen. It just turns off. And it's exactly 29 minutes and 45 seconds. Just like that. So yeah. if you have a show that's going to be 10 minutes long and you're going to be broadcasting a quick interview and, you, and you're and you shooting it that way, it's great. Or if you're pre-recording and you're using Wirecast to do your switching and record to disc and maybe you've got it broadcasting through a Hangout or something at the same time just for, for people who want to view it live, then it can work. But because it turns off after 29 minutes, unfortunately in a case like our show... It leaves us saying, okay, well, this would be a really great option, a really economical option. Th- my friend is selling his camera for $500, and you see the difference in quality between the two cameras. Uh, so it would be a really, really nice replacement as far as mm-hmm. quality goes. But unfortunately, we're an hour long. And because it sh- shuts off, it's HDMI, and HDMI is not technically hot swappable, so you can actually you know, crash your computer shutting it off on the fly like that. Oh. Could be a problem. Yeah, let's let's avoid that. Yes. <laughs> so besides the auto power off, I mean that's that's a really big thing. Um, if you're looking for 1080p video, it's not full 1080p technically. Mm-hmm. I don't think too many people are going to notice the difference unless they're watching it up on a 72 inch big screen. Right. It's still going to look a lot better than something like the consumer grade cameras. I think it's so, going to look a lot better. So the bottom line really is that it's a really good idea for like a 10 to 20 minute. I think so. Sweet. So what are you shooting? What are you going to be using Wirecast for? Uh, you know what? Here's, an, ex- here's a, an idea, okay? Sermons. 20, 25 minutes, maybe. Oh, okay. So if your church wants to shoot and make it really good quality, what about putting a 300 millimeter lens on a T2i, setting it at the back of the, the sanctuary and zooming in on oh, the okay. stage? Unless you've got a long-winded winded preacher, <laughs> you're in big trouble. But that could work. That would be a, a scenario that I can think of, or uh, maybe shorter shows. Recitals or... Yeah, yeah stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Where And maybe there's something where you could have two cameras and be switching between them every 20 minutes mm-hmm. and have a camera operator turn it off and back on again. Maybe that would work. But in our <laughs> case, unfortunately... We will not be making the switch. We won't be. No. Not possible. So the autofocus is obviously an issue as well. Um, Some of the newer cameras have active servo, and it is a lot better. But I think that between camcorders and DSLRs, the autofocus on the camcorder is far superior. But you don't get that depth of field. Mm -hmm. So that's that's the thing. You Mm -hmm. don't get the same speed. Even my D5100, if, if I were to shoot using the active servo, I find that there's too much delay between okay. when it's out of focus and when it's in focus. And sometimes you get that as it's trying to find the its subject. So overall, not not what well, you'd be looking for. Well, so, hey, thank you. If you find that, hey, maybe this is actually a, a really good option for you, uh, for perhaps your show, if you find that, uh, hey, what you showed tonight, uh, I shoot 20 minutes and I'd love to be able to have that kind of quality, uh, pop us an email live at category5.tv. We'd love to know how uh, how you're using uh, the things that you learn here on the show, Category 5 TV. So, All right. Well. JP mentioning in the chat room that I think the cons outweigh the pros, and I think in many, many cases that is the case here. But the pros, are, <laughs> it looks so good. It's so unfair. Oh. So unfair. Well, thank you very much. Robbie, are you ready for the news? Ready for the news. Ready for the news. Here are the top stories from the Category 5.tv newsroom. Microsoft has confirmed the start button is returning to the desktop modes taskbar of its Windows 8 operating system. The lack of facility, which has been in every previous version since Windows 95, has been one of the most controversial aspects of the software. However, it will not offer all the functionality previously associated with the feature. Instead, it will take take the users to the formerly named Metro interface. No. Yeah. 
No. So a left click on the icon will bring up the tile-based start screen designed for touchscreen users. Oh, give me a break. And then the right click will display a small menu of the options such as events viewer, device manager, and disk management. See? It's almost like Microsoft is... is Laughing at us. Laughing at us and saying, (laughs) fine, fine. You want the start menu so bad? Fine. We'll put a start button. We'll even label it start. (laughs) <laughs> in the bottom left of your screen where you expect it to be. But when you push it, it's not going to give you a start menu. Mm-mm. It's going to give you the metro look. The, you know, the squares. The squares. Those hideous squares that look like they were designed by eight-year-olds. My, my eight-year-old is a fantastic artist, by the way. I should just correct myself there. But seriously, <laughs> they're the squares with text and pictures on them. They look cheesy yeah thank you yeah exactly thank you but no thank you no another change will allow users to boot their computers directly into desktop mode meaning they can avoid ever using the start screen if they wish a pre oh, that's a plus yeah a little bit so you yeah. can make it look like a, which a is windows desktop okay. which is good yeah. So a preview download of Windows 8.1 will be released to the public this month and a final version before the end of the year. Hmm. Both will be free of charge to existing users. Okay. Obviously, they really want you to give this a try and they want to... Yeah. So now we can get to the desktop, but if you dare to push start, you're going to be back at Metro. That is correct. Okay, so the National Federation for the Blind says its members are unable to sign an e-petition calling for printed material to be more accessible to the visually impaired because of the CAPTCHA security. A CAPTCHA is a graphic or sound of a random word or numbers users must key in to prove they are human. This is hard for even me. So Yeah, uh, like I, Eric and I have been through this. It, it, sure, it's hard to read, and so yeah, sometimes I, it takes me three or four tries from my good eye. Yeah, everything okay. I do is on my phone, right? So the yeah. little captchas, they're oh, sure. small. Yeah. And try to make that out on a oh, three-inch screen. Oh, it's bad. We, it's, oh. Somebody somebody says, well, what about the audio captcha, right? Like if you're visually impaired, you could just use the audio captcha. And Eric and I have joked on the show about the, the time that we had tried the audio <laughs> captcha. And it was like... <laughs> Please enter it to the best of your ability. And so we were like, what are we supposed to do? Mash the keypad with our palms? <laughs> Seriously. It's yeah. useless. So this petition on the White House website has only received 8,200 signatures. On the White House website? On the White House website wow. to make, um, I, I guess an accessibility bill passed. Mm. So Damien Rose, editor of the BBC's Ouch blog for people with disabilities, said CAPTCHA graphics are a nightmare. Visually impaired people use screen readers to interpret their computers, their computer rather than their eyes, and the screens can't manage them. Ironically, if I see an audio cap- capture, I tend not to bother with it because it usually is such a poor experience. <laughs> Some of them sound like aliens talking, and they put weird background noises over them. That's exactly what I'm saying. Yeah. 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 See? And they're a bit of a joke in the blind community. So he spent over an hour on some and had to give up. That's unreal. Wow. I I understand that we do have some visually or some audibly uh, impaired and visually impaired uh, Mm -hmm. viewers. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I'd be interested if you have visual uh, issues, like you're unable to see the show. Um, would you let us know, you know, what are your thoughts on that? I've never really even thought about it. Mm-hmm. Because for me, you know, yeah, I'd have to try it a couple times. But to, to not be able to sign a petition because you can't. I know, a petition that will capture, help you. That's wrong. Like that is completely targeted to towards that. you and you can't. Oh, it's horrible. They do need to fix it. Yeah. All right. Internet service providers, ISPs, have criticized a new attempt to automatically block online pornography. The proposed online safety bill in the UK would require people to opt in and prove that they were over 18 to view adult content. Although unlikely to become law, a government advisor said the bill should keep the pressure on internet service providers. Companies providing broadband services warned that the approach was not a silver bullet. Conservative MP Claire Perry said that ISPs should act without regulation, but warned if they didn't or wouldn't, then they would have to step in. Hmm. Is that a good or a bad idea? Yeah, what do you think? I almost wonder if it would be a smarter, I- <laughs> pardon me, a smarter idea from a, 
uh, what's the free, uh, like it's not freedom of speech but just freedom mm-hmm. of what you're doing with your internet would it be smarter to have the approach of like google safe image search and all that you know the safe search on google yeah where you can actually turn it on mm-hmm. and then it filters to some degree your results well they must be able to filter it really well because google glass is not allowing any oh, really? explicit well, materials cool. at all like it okay. filters completely you cannot watch anything anything explicit in I, any way i think where it gets annoying is when you're online and you're you're doing something that's completely benign and all of a sudden something pops up like my wife was doing a search for pictures for her blog mm-hmm. and in among these pictures are some in this google mm, images yeah so could something like forcing the block and then having to opt out of it be the approach or should you have to opt into the block We'd love to hear your opinions. Email mm-hmm. us live at category5.tv or you can comment in the newsroom, newsroom.category5.tv. All right. Here is another one. Are you always forgetting your password? Motorola is working on some rather unusual solutions. They've <laughs> unveiled an electronic tattoo that sticks to your skin. It has circuits so gadgets can identify you. That one's not bad. Okay, that sounds kind of smart. I like that. In Just a way, kind of like Mark of the Beast-ish. But, okay, so a tattoo that has a microchip. If it was, if it was beautiful, I would do that. Yeah, no problem. It looks like flowers. <laughs> yeah, exactly. A butterfly, dragonfly. Okay. Um, the, that could work, though. That could work. Another experimental idea is a password pill that you swallow mm-hmm. that tra- transmits a signal to devices outside your body. The pill doesn't need batteries because it's powered by stomach acid, but really? Motorola says it won't be on sale anytime soon. So you would swallow this pill, yeah, and then you would wait a little while while it dissolves. I guess your stomach acid <laughs> will dissolve the pill, and then and start broadcasting. And then it will broadcast to an external device what your password is. I would be so afraid of that malfunctioning that I would never forget my password again. Oh yeah, again. and you know like what happens fear to things of forgetting. that you put in your mouth, right? They eventually are not. Come out. Yeah. How about no on that one? Yeah. I would rather a pretty little tattoo. The, my fear with these things is that they're going to be expensive. It's new technology, and it sounds pretty sophisticated. So this is one of those pills that you have to keep taking over and over again. Oh, and you know when your pills get stuck in your throat. Oh, right. You get your password. You need your password, and you've got this pill stuck in your throat, and you're just <laughs> you're searching Come around on. for water. I see nothing but bad with I this. I think that there could be other ways, like, you know. Put your thinking caps back a, on Motorola. A smart password. Yeah. Oh, this is you. true. Yeah. yeah. You could do that. That's crazy. <laughs> Very sci fi. All right. So, Minecraft maker Mojang has released an early version of its newest game, Scrolls. The battle game pits two players against each other who fight using heroes, artifacts, and spells from a virtual deck of cards. The, okay. The open beta for Scrolls started yesterday. Could it be? So this is very similar to other sort of games like yeah. Magic the Gathering where people, people maybe with lesser social skills gather <laughs> around. <laughs> I'm so sorry if anybody plays Magic. <laughs> <laughs> and now you don't even have to leave your own oh, home. Boy. Now you don't need any friends at all to play this game. But you do because it's multiplayer. Yeah, uh-huh. so you can find online. Yeah, yeah, that's multiplayer. True. This the is true. Social anti-social game. It's pretty crazy. Cool. So yeah, the open beta for Squirrels started yesterday. It does kind of look like magic, though. It totally looks like it. Yeah. Get the full ver- not that I would know. Get the full <laughs> stories at category five dot TV slash newsroom. The category five dot TV newsroom is researched by Roy W. Nash with contributions by our community of viewers. If you have a news story you would think is worthy of on air mention, email newsroom at category five dot TV. For the Category 5.TV newsroom, I'm Sasha Dermatis. Sasha, my wife Becca and I started watching Arrested Development season four. Which okay. is only available on Netflix. Oh. So if you don't have Netflix and you want to watch the final season of Arrested Development, get on over to cat5.tv slash Netflix. Of course, if you're not into the, the humorous undertones of Arrested Development, you can get any show uh, that's on Netflix, movies, unlimited, for a full month, absolutely free, cat5.tv slash Netflix. Category 5 is also brought to you by NetTalk. Uh, they've got unlimited 
text messaging plans going on right now. All you have to do is upgrade your NetTalk Duo account with the NetTalk text plan. And for the cost of a couple of cups of coffee per month, you're going to receive unlimited texting throughout the U.S. and Canada. Check out cat5.tv slash phone for all of the details and to start mo- saving money today. This is Category 5 Technology TV. Thanks for joining us tonight. My name is Robbie Ferguson. I am Sasha Dermatis. Robbie. Nice to see you, Sasha. Robbie, guess what's, what's happening in two weeks? What is it? What could it be? Well, this is episode 298. That's right. So in two weeks, we will be at episode 300. I am excited about this. Yeah. Are you excited? Yeah. I'm excited. It, um, it will be hosted by our... Harry Webb. Yes. So. Carrie Webb, folks, is going to be joining us for the 300th episode in a couple of weeks. It's uh, June 18th, and really looking forward to it. We're actually going to be taking a look back over the past 300 episodes. We're not, no, we're not going to make you sit through 300 <laughs> hours. <laughs> it's a 300-hour <laughs> category Marathon. five extravaganza. And Garvey's saying, no, no, 299. <laughs> What? Of episode 11. What happened with episode 11, Robbie? You'll just have to watch episode 300 and find all, all uh, out about it. Oh. oh. Interesting that it wasn't episode 13 or something yes. crazy like that. <laughs> no, by then we knew better. Uh, yeah, but we, we're going to be taking a look back and we're actually going to learn all about how you came onto the show, how each of the co-hosts came to be, because quite often the question is, you know, wh- where are you from? How did, how did Robbie and you connect? Um, so we're really going to be taking some time to, to talk about that on the episode 300, which is going to be cool. And after the show, we're going to have a full hangout. There's going to be a lot of Category 5 crew here in the studio that night. And we're going to have a live hangout after the show. So you don't want to miss out. Get your webcam all connected and primed and get your Google uh, Chrome installed and get uh, Google Plus activated. And then you can join us in the hangout. You can actually chat with us mm-hmm. uh, after the show. This is your two-week notice. Two-week notice. So, there we go. Mm -hmm. Um, Robbie, are we ready for some viewer questions? Please, love to. Excellent. Because I have a question here from Robert Gorzinski. Hey, Robert. Um, And Robert says, I have an old Pentium computer that is running the Arduino... Arduino Arduino Mm -hmm. programming program under Ubuntu 10.10 that I need to move over to a newer machine. I could just reinstall a newer version of Ubuntu and Arduino program on the new machine, but this will take a little bit of work to get Work, a little bit of work to get going and trying to find the newer libraries, etc. So I was thinking of instead creating an image of the working machine and using it on VirtualBox. My question is, can you convert a running physical machine to a virtual machine easily? I need to have this up and running fairly quickly. Thank hmm. you. Interesting question. I love it. Um, taking a real machine and virtualizing it. Mm-hmm. That's can what it, we want to do, right? Can it be done? Yeah. How? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so there's a program called Clonezilla, and you can get Clonezilla Live is what I would what I would go for. So just bring up your web browser, and uh, let's take a look. Clonezilla.org. Go to the left hand side here, Live CD slash USB. Click on that, and scroll down a little bit, and you'll see Download ISO file. Okay, so click on that. And there is the stable release and the alternate, uh, alternative uh, stable release. We want to go with the alternative, which is based on Ubuntu as opposed to Debian. The reason we go with the alternative version is because then it will support more hardware because it's it has some non-free stuff included with it. So clicking that, we can get the download and go through the process. So once you've got Clonezilla, you burn that to a CD and you boot up that old computer and you can actually tell it to save to an external hard drive. You can image the entire hard drive. You can image uh, to an external drive, like as an image. Save it as an image. That's going to be the easiest way. Uh, Or you can save it through the network to a Samba share. Or if you've already got the new computer, you could save it over to that computer, set up a, a share or something. So then what you do... And I'm trying to think of how I can word everything in in a non-complex way, and it's very, very doable. So using Clonezilla, you create an image of that computer. It's very straightforward. You boot from the Clonezilla Live CD, and you just follow the prompts. And what you want to do is you want to create an image of a hard drive. So it's uh, device to image. 
then you tell it where you want to save the image and that could be any device or a network share then on your new computer create a virtual machine with a virtual box or whatever it is that you want to use and you can specify what the uh, what the operating system is as far as for virtual box you know what it's concerned with which was an old version of, of Linux right mm -hmm. so specify that and you can specify the kernel in virtual box then Again, you've got that ISO file for CloneZilla Live. So pop it onto that computer or re-download it to that computer, the, the host, and mount it as a CD to your virtual machine that you just created. Boot it up. You're going to be back in CloneZilla Live, and now you want to tell it, okay, now we're not going to image from device to image. We're going to image from image to device. Remember, there's no device that you're actually working with. It's a virtual device. Clonezilla is not going to know the, know the difference. It's going to think your virtual hard drive is a physical hard drive, and it will actually clone that image back to that virtual machine. So now you've got an exact copy of that old computer on a virtual machine. You can boot it up, and it's going to work just perfectly. The only thing that you have to be <coughs> pardon me, absolutely mindful of when you create your virtual machine's hard drive, it can be dynamic or fixed. It doesn't matter but you have to specify that it is at least the exact size of the original computer's hard drive. Okay, So if it was an 80 gig hard drive, you want to create, a, let's say, a dynamic disk in your virtual machine for 85 gigs, say. And then that's going to make sure that as you're imaging it, it's not going to give you any trouble and say, there's not enough space for this image. So It works really, really well. Um, let us know how it goes. Excellent. I think that, uh, I think you'll find Clonezilla is a very, very useful tool. Good question, Robert. Mm. And if I could be, if I could suggest, now that you've done that, take that VDI file or whatever it is, VMDK, that's mm -hmm. the virtual hard drive file, mm -hmm. and back it up. Make it a part of your backup set. So then you can back up the entire virtual machine, mm -hmm. and you don't have to worry about it anymore. Fabulous. Mm. Excellent. Thanks for the question. I have a question from Nimi Erki. All right. All right. Amy. Hey, Robbie, you have done great work with the site and the show. Unfortunately, I have made a mistake that eventually led to a situation that a photocopy of a passport was showing on a Facebook-like social network as a profile picture. I was devastated but calmly mm. did everything that I was capable of to minimize the error. Ultimately, I'm responsible for that happening. I did get some help. Um, my question is... How bad is the situation? Um, it's a Finnish passport. Um, right. And Nimi's going to be contacting some other people as well, but was interested on your views. Okay. Yeah, you want to contact so. the authorities, I'm sure. But So wh what can you do with a passport? I mean, identity theft is a big concern, right? That would be the big, that would be the big deal, would mm. be identity theft. How, how good was the scan? Like, how, how good was the quality? What is a passport? I don't travel. So what does a passport sh show? It's not like a social insurance number or anything like that. No, I feel like... It's really the, just your, your basic info. The image itself. Like if it's yeah. just the actual image on the passport, that shouldn't be a problem. The picture. The picture. The mugshot. Exactly. Yeah. It's but the it's rest the of the information yeah. that's the main concern. Is that what It would be my personal... Yeah, you'd never really want that kind of personal information to go up. And if it's a Facebook-like social media platform, it may give the illusion of privacy, but really you have no privacy. Mm -hmm. And once once it's online, it's it's online. It's you're, you're, you you can't take it off. Mm -hmm. You My might be lucky. You know, maybe nobody cached it. But let's say I saw your profile, and now it's cached on my computer in my browser. Right. And so if I happen to be malicious and knew to check that, but what can you really do with it? I don't, I don't really think that I would be overly concerned unless you are in a situation where you think that somebody might try something on you. Yeah. Yeah, you're best to, to just report it just so that it yeah. actually has, you, you have a trail that if anything were to happen mm -hmm. that you've... But yeah. I think you're best to err on the side of caution and I think that's maybe why you sent in the question tonight is really just to be careful and, and maybe use that as an opportunity to kind of kick yourself in the pants and be a little more careful next time, really. Mm -hmm. I think, you you know, you maybe won't make the same mistake again. Yeah, it's a really good point just to say to everybody, just be careful what you post online. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because everybody sees it forever. Forever. No <laughs> deleting it. Somebody said to me, well, I deleted my Facebook profile. 
Uh, no, you didn't. Uh, you might have pushed the delete button and authorized it, but uh, you didn't delete it. It's still there. Uh, mm -hmm. I can access it. If you think it's not true, I mean, if you've deleted your profile, go to your go to Facebook and log in. What's going to happen? It's going to say, "Oh, welcome back. Here's all your stuff." Yeah, uh, we missed you. Creepy. Yeah. But not only that, but they've archived everything, and who knows what they're using it for? Mm -hmm. They use your Facebook photos for advertising and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, everything you do online is just using Facebook as the example. Yeah. Hoi. Okay. Thanks for the question. Um, Richard has a question. Hey, Richard. Richard recently installed a home server to run a Minecraft server for his kids and a TeamSpeak server for himself. All right. So he says, I set it up with Windows 7 Pro and I just used TeamViewer to log into it and manage when things go skew, skew if. I'm an everyday Linux user, Ubuntu or Open... S-U-S-E? Yeah, Open SUSE. Open SUSE. So I'd much much prefer my server to be running Linux. However, I'm no use at the command line and forget commands all the time. So is there any way of running the Linux server with a GUI? I know all the groans from the Linux community about security and speed and ease, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, but I don't care about all all that. It it's I don't care about all that. It's still better than letting Windows do it. I just need to be able to host the same things, but with a GUI and a way to remove it from my sure. main PC. Okay. Hope you can help. Um, can yeah, the thing about a Linux server is it is the Linux operating system at its core. And typically, I wouldn't put a GUI on a server because of security. No, it has nothing to do with security. It has to do with the fact I don't want any overhead running, right? So I wouldn't install GNOME or, or KDE or anything like that. But I might install LXDE as a very lightweight uh, desktop environment, for example. But for what you're doing, you might even consider trying using um, web server-based um, GUIs, if you will, you know, control mechanisms. The first thing that came to mind was MineOS Plus. And I, I'm not sure about getting TeamSpeak to actually work on this, um, but it is Linux, so you should be able to get the packages for it and, uh, and make it work. But taking a really quick look at their website, it's mineosplus.org. It's simply a Linux distro that is specifically a Minecraft server. So it's, it's really, really a, an easy way to get yourself up and running. You basically download the product and you install it. Their website seems a little bit slow right now at the moment, but... There is a video here um, that is entitled Setting Up a Minecraft Server Using Mine OS, so that's pretty decent. That'll help you, and you can grab the latest ISO right there. So what that is, again, is it's Linux. It's already got Minecraft server already configured, and that's going to be your most challenging one. Team, team viewer, or TeamSpeak is mm -hmm. going to be quite easy to set up, so um, give it a try. Um, see if that helps you get up and going. But as far as getting, you know, if you wanted to just install Debian and then put you know, use the Debian server edition and then put LXDE on it. Just go uh, SU, enter, enter your root password, then type apt-get, apt-get, space, install, space, LXDE. And that'll give you a lightweight desktop environment. And then just, the, you know, the trick is when it comes to security is you don't run your desktop environment as root. So you don't ever be root while you're running the desktop environment. So that That is where... It's very dangerous. That's where the security like, gets... Well, that's why Windows has so many problems, is because you're able to run the GUI as the administrator. Mm. So if you don't run as the administrator, you can't make accidental changes that are going to break your whole system, and things can't get in because you're not running as a user that has those privileges. So that's what you want to be careful of. Well, thank you, Richard. Thanks for the question. I have a comment from Peter Lewis. Hey, Peter. Um, Peter says, I was writing a database for a client which involved using postcodes. The client wanted to check if the postcode was valid. Okay. They did not want to use the internet-based checker via the GB post office. Um, the client may not have had the internet installed in all locations he wants to use it. 
Um, I went to Google Maps to see if it would give me a location in the UK with a postcode. This was to check the function that I had written to check the validation of postcodes. Mm -hmm. I first went to my home location, which showed a nice picture of a house and a car. Using the buttons on the side, I could move around the view. Next, I tried the X pub across the road, and it showed the picture of an empty field with a bridge over the brook. I tried two doors down for me, and it showed the same view. Checking houses in the street and putting into Google all showed the same view. I know the housing number system in this road is a bit strange. Um, it's I like like Ireland, as the numbers on one side of the road ascend in value and on the other side they descend in value. No way. <laughs> that is crazy. I've lived here for 25 years and cannot understand how to find a house along my street. <laughs> Google is That's very tough. good at avoiding UK taxes, but they cannot get their head around the numbering system in a small Northern Ireland village. I also found a picture from Bing, which sums it all up in sums it all up like no words could say. Do you have so, that picture? I have it. it. Let me just that see. Something I'm to bring that up something here? you have. It would be tough, I think, if you were in a situation like that where. Oh, yeah, I can't display that unfortunately because of copyright laws. <laughs> but, it is a funny picture. Yeah. Yeah. So there you go. That, that would be tough if you're developing, trying to map stuff without using the APIs that are available to you. But that's why those APIs uh, from the post office are available so that you can tap into those resources. But if you're not internet connected and you need to be able to tap into them, what do you do? Yeah. That's tough. Wow. Tough. I'm still blown away by the fact that the numbers ascend on one side of the street and descend on well, the other side. Could it be that it, it's like this and then... And back. then loops down. Like it goes up one way and then back the other way once it gets to the end of the road. Oh, yeah. Could be. <laughs> so that way the, the highest number would be across the street from the, the lowest, lowest number. The lowest number. And as you go, it would that would be what it would So I wonder if that's how it works. I never knew that so anywhere was like that. Kind of a snake, yeah. Like hmm. it would go up one side of the street and then down the other side of the street. Interesting. But you could just scroll along on Google Street View and see everybody, right? Absolutely. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. <laughs> but the the numbers, I think I, I get what he's saying, though. The numbers would be messed up on Google because you put in 25-something Boulevard, and it's across the road from 3,000. It kind of confused things. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Wow. Interesting. Interesting. Thank you, Peter. No. There we go. I have a, uh, a question from... Kek, kek, kek. Ah, kek, kek, kek. Kek, kek, kek. Hi, Robbie. Thanks for the quick reply and the advice. Okay, sure. so um, I've been a Linux user for almost 15 years, and I've already learned a bunch of new stuff from just the few episodes I've watched. Yes! Okay, so if you don't mind, I'd like to share some of my experience. We taught him things. Yay! It's good. <laughs> it is good. <laughs> we right. are learning. Yes. <laughs> I'm still learning every day. So am I. Yes. So am I, friends. Um, okay, so I am a CEO of a small industrial electronic manufacturing firm in San Diego. Mm -hmm. We use Linux for all of our servers and for over half of our desktop machines. Good man. Using Ubuntu for all of the desktops. The more we use Linux, the fewer the tearing out our hair computer problems we have, which is fabulous. That's true. When we migrate users from Windows to Linux, we convert their existing Windows install to run a virtualized to run as a virtualized guest on their new Linux host. Did you use Clonezilla? How did you do it? We'll let Robert know. Um, yeah, that's interesting. That there you, you go. Trying to do the same thing, basically, and this, that's a cool idea. Sorry. Yeah, that's good. I love the idea that you're taking a user's Windows machine, converting it to a virtual machine, so they can actually be running Linux but then still have access to their windows just in case for some reason they need it. That's true. That's really cool. Yeah, he says it works really well since all the people still have their windows desktop unchanged and gradually use Linux for more and more of their tasks without a lot of pressure. Yeah. They are encouraged to use Linux for all of their web and email use to reduce the risk of malware. <laughs> so there you go. Makes sense. Um, and he would love to help out on the show if there's any way. Let's see, is that the question? Let's see. Maybe he's just write that and say is, hi. There you go. Tell us these That's wonderful things about how he's converting his office to Linux. Absolutely. So there you go. So Thanks. thank you. That really helped actually for It's interesting to hear how, you know, what strategies 
uh, people are using to get people to make the switch to Linux. Because mm-hmm. when you realize, okay, well, what was that that he said there that we're using Linux as the internet portion of the computer because then we don't have to deal with malware. Brilliant. What's, you know, nine times out of ten, the biggest problem on a computer is, well, why is this pop-up happening that is taking over my computer and, you know, it's always the malware. Mm-hmm. This phishing stuff and all this junk that gets into there. All the crummy stuff. hmm Nice. Thank you for the questions. Thanks so much. All right. Anything else for me? For questions? That questions, is, comments, anything? Questions, more? comments, thoughts, concerns? <laughs> chat us in the chat room. It's Category 5 on Freenode. And, of course, you can email us live at Category5.tv. We love to receive your emails. And uh, Sasha mentions those to me on the air here. But nice Excellent. to see everybody joining us in the chat room, people who are watching on YouTube, people watching on Miro Internet TV, uh, Blip.tv. Nice to see you. Um, hey, Jot. Hey, Jameson. Chris Reich joining Chris us in the Reich. chat room. Nice to see you. Yeah. Linus84. Good to see you. Nice to have you here tonight. All right. Lots of action in the chat room tonight. Yeah, it's flying by. And let's see. We have... You, you're talking like... <laughs> like, uh, I'm like, I don't know. What are you talking about? Um, so. Donations. Oh, yeah. So That's where would people... people can help out. How would how would people send in donations? Well, um, we are a voluntary show, mm-hmm. so as you know, um, and uh, you know there are costs associated with doing the show, and there are you know I'm, I'm always looking for ways to make the show better. Mm-hmm. As you know, we're looking at ways to possibly in- improve the video quality, and unfortunately, the the DSLR thing is not going to work in our case. But maybe there's something else out there that that we could do. Uh, but it takes donations in order to be able to do those things. Uh, and that's uh, cat5.tv slash c to do that. And you can, you know, give $5 a month or $5 one time and it makes a huge difference. Uh, every little bit helps. And we ha- we have a huge viewership too. I mean, there, I don't know if you realize how many people watch the show, but if if you go to map.category5, or pardon me, map.cat5.tv, uh, you'll see our viewer location map. You see how many people are actually watching the show. And it's amazing. Unbelievable. And truthfully, not to sound really cheesy and cliche, but if everybody gave a buck, like that would be... The price of a coffee. Everybody would be paid. (laughs) The price of a coffee. A buck a month and and we'd we'd have those HD cameras pretty quick, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. Something to think about anyway, but... Um, and Hillary had her iPod stolen, and, and so one of the things is that we've been collecting donations for specifically was to replace her iPod and maybe get her a, an iTunes uh, card to help her get that initial uh, music, mm-hmm. you know, to get her get her back on, on track with her music. It's just kind of a, a depressing, kind of aggravating thing when someone breaks into your car and steals your, your entire music library from your iPod. Oh, yeah, heartbreaking. So, and mm-hmm. so we can get that put together for her. Thank you, Jot, on the uh, on the chat room, posting Appreciate the that, links yeah. to the viewer map and to the donation. Excellent. Thank you. Well, it's good to see you, Sasha. Nice to see you. How have you been? You. We didn't really get a chance. To, we jumped right into the feature tonight, but... I know. I have been up. fabulous. Be I, am, I am going to Jamaica at the end of the month, what? which is why there's such a stark difference between my color and yours. Tanning, yes. I'm pre-tanning All right, because the, yeah, I think that the temperatures there in the end of June, beginning of July segment are about 35 degrees a day. So a bit warmer than here. Yeah. So, um, I will be wearing like 60 SPF and I probably will still burn, <laughs> but prior to that, I am going to get as tanned as possible. So I'm going to go see right. a reggae concert and if there's any category five viewers that want to uh that would be say cool. hi anybody in, in jamaica legit yeah that's right it's called totally reggae to reggae it'll be in nice. port antonio yeah cool well, yeah i'm gonna do a little fun. yeah i'm gonna do a little off resort fun very cool yeah so that's what's new with me <laughs> how nice. about you uh i saw star trek we went to the theater to see in what is it into darkness mm-hmm it was pretty good. It was pretty awesome. Um, Did you get Becca to dress up? I tried, and she's like, no. And her excuse was that it wasn't opening night. She's like, well, I might if it was opening night. But it's like, ah. Oh. So I didn't dress up either. I was going to do the Spock ears and everything. But no. 
And we would have really been made fun of, absolutely. Why? Nobody else was dressed up? Nobody was dressed up. No. Oh, you We would... got great seats, though. And it was, a, it was a great movie, and, we, you know, we enjoyed it thoroughly. We don't get to go to the movie much with, with three young kids at home, but uh, that was a, a fun time. Nice. Yeah, if you haven't seen it, see it in the theater. It's worth it. Is it 3D? I didn't see it in 3D. We've never seen a 3D movie, actually, because <laughs> we just don't want to, you know, when you only get to go to the theater once in a while, you just want to go see a movie. You don't want to ex- you, know, you don't want to have to dodge pieces of the movie. I read at no. You. I read that Star Trek was all post production 3D. Oh. So it wasn't shot in 3D. It was they added the 3D later, and I'm like, no, nah, that doesn't really appeal to me. I did watch Jurassic Park in 3D, that's and that's cool. clearly that post. Yeah. Clearly post. Was that neat? Yeah, it was really good. Cool. Yeah. So. Interesting. Mm-hmm. We'll have to do that. That's all the time that we have for tonight. For another week. Remember, two weeks and it's episode 300. Don't miss it. Mark it on your calendar June 18th. And next week, Erica Lalonde is going to be joining me here in the studio. So that's going to be a lot of fun. You know, Rocking fun. Blast. Always good to see you. Nice to see everybody. See you. All right. Take care. Have a great week. Bye. Bye-bye. you enjoyed the show. Category 5 TV broadcasts live from Barrie, Ontario, Canada every Tuesday at 7 p.m. Eastern. If you're watching this on demand or through cable TV, check out the local showtimes in your area at Category5.tv and find out when you can watch live and interact in the community chat room. Category 5 is a production of Prodigy Digital Solutions and is licensed under Creative Commons Attribution 2.5 Canada. We'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in. 